Good morning and welcome to New Beginnings Wesleyan Church's online service. I am Chelsea and along with my husband Johnny, we are the pastors of the church. And this is Corey. And we are very happy today to be able to bring you announcements and prayer. So we wanted to share a few announcements to start. And the first thing is we just want to let you know every Friday we have a prayer time at church. Um, we really just have some prayer stations set up. You saw it this week. What did you think? I liked it. <laughs> so it's just a time to come in. We're here for about an hour. You don't have to stay for the whole hour. You can stay for just a little bit. Or if you want to, you can stay for the whole time. And we just have some stations set up so you can pray over some specific things. You know, personal needs for our church here, our community, and then just the church globally. So it really is a nice time just to come in, spend some time in prayer, um, connect with God, uh, and just do that. And if you wanted some prayer... Johnny or myself are here and we could pray over you and, and spend that time doing that as well. So every Friday at one o'clock is prayer time here at the church. And what do you got for us today? We're having a second Gold Sox game. August 7th at 7 p.m. is when the game starts. Yeah. Um, the tickets are six dollars and um, if you want a ticket, contact Chelsea. Yeah, give me a call, uh, send me a text, send me an email, whatever you want to do. But we're going to go as a church family and just go have some fun watching baseball. She or, likes to talk. <laughs> I was going to say. So she's gonna or have for, fun. Yeah, or for some of us, it's just about spending time together and enjoying that. You know, if I was talking to James, I'd probably think he'd like uh, maybe the treats that they have there as well. So we're just going. We're going to have a great time as a church to the Gold Sox game. Um, and lastly, we just want to tell you about ladies, we are going to start a Bible study on August 9th. Yeah, it's going to be every Monday at 2 o'clock at the church. Um, so it'll be a really great time. You just bring your Bible, uh, we bring snacks to share, uh, bring a friend, any, anything like that. We're just going to be a really good time of all of us hanging out together, diving into God's Word, learning it, and just um, spending that time together and growing. So every Monday, starting August 9th at 2 o'clock at the church. So those are our announcements today. Big and, announcements. Yeah, big announcements. And now we would just like to go into a time of prayer. So we've been doing it a little bit differently. We're just going to go on into it, close our eyes, and Corey's going to go ahead and start us off. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. And I thank you that it's beautiful outside. And I pray that you would, um, I thank you that it's Sunday. And I pray that you would help um, the grieving right now as a lot of people have lost a lot of people and that's going bad and I pray that you would help their grieving and that you would help to stop people from dying and that they will live longer and I pray for Greg Frere as he's moving to Washington and he has a cancer um, and I pray that the transition to go well. Yeah, we just really want to lift up Greg Freer as um, he's just moving to Washington to be with family. And Lord, um, we know he's going to be traveling. Uh, and that's a, a big task, especially when you're battling cancer and under treatment. So we just pray that you would bless that trip. You just help it to go really smoothly. And Lord, he's transitioning from care down um, here to care up there. And, you know, sometimes those kinds of things can get complicated and hurdles can be put in the way. So, Lord, we just pray that you would just help all of that to go so smoothly. We pray that there wouldn't be any interruptions in treatment. And, Lord, we just pray that you would continue to help this treatment to battle this and help him to have more time with his family uh, and just really bless him as he goes about that path. And, um, Lord, we're going to miss him, but we know that he is going where his heart is calling him, and, and that's a wonderful thing. So we pray that you would just bless that, Lord. Lord, I pray for John Nicola's son. Who also has cancer, but that you would bless him as he's going through this too. Yeah, God, we just want to also pray for for everyone who's battling cancer, Lord. Um, whether at the beginning, uh, you know, just figuring out what treatments are going to be, whatever that may be, or in the midst of their treatments and what's going on there, Lord, we just pray that you would be with those who are going through that. Just be with them, comfort them, and help them through that. Um, really help to reduce side effects Lord we know that chemo can just really take a lot out of people and, and do some different things Lord so we pray that you would just bless them Lord we have a couple friends who are in the hospital with COVID right now uh, well one who's come out of the hospital Susie Brandt Lord we just pray for her she had COVID and pneumonia and she was in the hospital and was very sick 
She's back home now, and we just want to continue to pray for her recovery, and that you would just bless her, um, help her to fully uh, overcome this, and, and just to be okay, Lord. And um, Teresa's friend Tiffany is still in the hospital, Lord. She's been in there for some time, and uh, battling COVID and pneumonia at the same time, and Lord, we just know that's scary and, and difficult. So we just pray for a full recovery for her and for Susie and all the rest of the people who have been in the hospital. We know our numbers have gone up a great deal. And Lord, those who are going in the hospital, it's, it's not a small thing. So we just pray that you would come alongside of them, come for them as they're there. We know that's scary and to be isolated from everybody. So we just pray for them, pray for full recoveries and that the medicines will work and that they will be able to come home and, and join their families again soon, Lord. God, we want to lift up another friend who's been in the hospital, Tim Newcomer's um, friend Brandy. She was very ill, went into a coma um, for well over a month, Lord, and she's out of that coma, but she is still on the road to recovery, and Lord, we just pray that you will continue to walk alongside of her, bless her, and help her to, to get fully back, uh, back to normal without any side effects from everything that's happened, Lord. To the Lord, I pray for Aaron, the Lord, his daughter, Kim. I pray that she'll be able to get that liver transplant that she needs and that she'll be able to live a longer life. And I think that, you, that she's still in you. Yeah, God, we just want to praise you for that, Lord. The doctors gave her, you know, 90 days here, just a month here and what that. And she has just continued uh, to just defy all of that, Lord. And we know the power of prayer and we know that that answer comes to you. We just pray that you're using that for doctors to really really just look to you and, and understand the power of, of prayer and the power that comes from you, Lord. And we just pray that you would lift her up. We know that she's extremely tired from that liver not working anymore and, and just doesn't feel good. So I pray that you would help her to get rest. Pray that you would um, help to, to move things in the direction where she can be fully healed, Lord. We pray for her family as they are caretakers and, and watching over her. And we, we know that can be um, just full of worry and stress, Lord. And so we just pray that you would bless Ira and Dolores and, and, and um, Kim as well, Lord. And just take care of them and watch over them, Lord. And God, we want to pray a special prayer over uh, Melody Spurgeon. Um, she's, we've been praying for her for a while. She's just about four, if not five now, years old and has brain cancer, Lord. And um, they put treatment on hold and Last week they found out um, that they have to move forward pretty aggressively with some things. And she started chemo, she had to have a lumbar puncture. Um, she's been recovering from that and, and just starting that process of being on chemo again. And Lord, we know that really tears down her body. So Lord, we just wanna pray and lift her up right now. You would just comfort her and help her through that. At, at, at such a young age, it's really hard to understand why you gotta take some things that make you feel so, so tired and so yucky, Lord. And so we just pray for her. Lord, there's going to have to be upcoming surgeries and radiation, and she has a cyst that needs to be drained, and there's still a lot to come. God, please give the doctors wisdom on the right path for her to really help start to defeat this, Lord. And we pray for the surgeries that are upcoming, that, that she will do well in them, and that they will be able to get this cancer and take it out, God. Um, and we just want to pray for her family. We know that this is hard, and it's scary, and it's stressful, and we just pray that you lift them up. Help them to rest well at night. Help them to have a sense of peace over the right steps of what to do next, Lord. And, and please just bless them and, and this time that they have together as they're, they're battling this, Lord. I just pray that you would surround them and protect them from any other things that might happen, um, whatever they may be, if you would just watch over and protect their household, Lord. And God, we just, we just want to pray for your guidance and your direction, Lord. We pray that... Um, all who are watching can just um, hear your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you're you know, guiding in a direction, that you, you ask things of us, Lord, and pray that we are able to be obedient, no matter what it may be, no matter how big or how small it may be, Lord. Pray that you would knock down any barriers, whether, whether we're not able to hear what you're asking us, that you would just take that barrier away. Whether it's fear to be obedient, whatever other obstacle would be in the way, Lord, pray that we would be able to remove that and help us to be obedient to you. God, we just pray today that you'd lift up both um, Teresa and uh, Johnny as he delivers the message and Teresa delivers worship and that your Holy Spirit would just fill us as we listen um, to both, Lord. We thank you that you are God who likes to hear what's on our heart and likes to be involved in our lives. 
we just thank you for that and just amazed at how how special it is to be loved by you god we thank you for today amen well we just want to say thank you and we're going to go ahead and pass it over to Teresa. thank you for that intro i'm Teresa. we're so glad you've chosen to join us at new beginnings wesleyan today we're honored that you've chosen to spend your time with us this way and we pray that the Lord will speak to you through the music, through the word, through prayer, through something that the Lord will touch you today and bless you and give you something that will keep you going through the week. This morning we're going to be just loving God today through the music. We're going to start with, I love you, Lord. We're going to then go to, Your Love Never Fails. And then a couple of old hymns, just because I can, and I like these two. Love Lifted Me, and To God Be the Glory, Great Things He Has Done. Now, in the, the live service, I think I'm going to be asking folks, when we get to that last song, to be thinking about something specific, and maybe even share with us, uh, what God is doing, has done, or what you're asking Him to do, and give Him the glory for it as we sing. But we'll start out with, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh, my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I for me every day. Your love never fails. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes with the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid. Because I know that you love me, your love never fails. The wind is strong and the water's deep. I'm not alone here in this open seas. Your love never fails. The chasm was far too wide. I never thought I'd reach the other side. Your love never fails. Cause you stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me. 
your love never fails. Cause you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. Yes, you make all things work together for my good. You stay the same through the ages. Your love never changes. There may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. And when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid, because I know that you love me. Because I know that you love me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me, love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. All my heart to him I give, ever to him I'll cling. In his blessed presence live, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true merits my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to, to him belongs. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Praise God. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his Son who yielded his life an atonement for sin, and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. 
Great things he has taught us, great things he has done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he has done. And give him the glory, great things he has done. And I'm sure he's got more great things planned for us all. Thank you, Lord. And now to Pastor Burke for the sermon today. Thanks for joining. Hey, good morning, and uh, so happy to be here with you, and thank you so much, Teresa, for continuing to lead us in worship uh, week in and week out, and just uh, really help us to just listen to the Spirit and be able to praise God at the same time. Such a wonderful thing. Just thank you so much. Um, my name is Johnny Burke. Uh, you met my wife and daughter earlier with announcements and prayer, and I'm so happy to be with you on this first day of August uh, for our online service. And um, just, I gotta tell you, I really had a great time at game night on Friday night. I don't know if you were able to be there. If you weren't, I would highly recommend you try and make our next one. We usually do them about every three months. This was our first one since COVID started, and it was just a great time of hanging out, eating good food, playing fun games, just a, a great time. So I, I hope you can join us for a future one, but we've got a Gold Sox game this coming Saturday first, so hopefully if you're able to make that out in the heat, um, please let us know. We'll grab you a ticket and Go out there and watch the Gold Sox on Saturday night and just spend some good time in fellowship, just in enjoying some of the things of the summer that are going on around here in the greater Yuba Sutter area. So, <clears throat> hey, we are, I'm going to jump right in today. You know, we've been going through a series uh, for the last few weeks now called Walking with Jesus. And, and each week during the series, we are bringing a teaching about how someone either learned from Jesus or Jesus was teaching them or someone spoke about Jesus to teach people about how to walk with Jesus. And so each week's a little bit different. Could be a testimony, could be just, uh, you know, actual direct teaching, a variety of different things. And um, last week we talked about Zacchaeus. He might have been with us for that. It was a great, uh, great time talking about the wee man Zacchaeus, which is way more than just a little guy, but a guy who had big, uh, big things going on with Jesus. And we learned some lessons from him last week. And so this week we're going to talk about the Samaritan woman. You may have also heard this story as the woman at the well in Samaria. So uh, if you've never heard this story before, I'd like to read it all to you. Now, <clears throat> it's pretty long, 40-something verses, uh, I think 42 verses in the book of John, chapter 4. So bear with me. I'm going to read through the whole story, and then we're going to look at some lessons to grab from the Samaritan woman. So here we go. John, chapter 4, verse 1 on, says this. Jesus knew the Pharisees had heard that he was baptizing and making more disciples than John. Though Jesus himself didn't baptize them, his disciples did. So he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He had to go through Samaria on the way. To, on the way. Eventually he came to the Samaritan village of Sichar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? <clears throat> Jesus replied, 
If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoyed? Jesus replied, Anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband. For you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? Jesus replied, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship Him that way. For God is spirit, so those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then, his disciples came back. They were shocked to find him talking to a woman, but none of them had the nerve to ask, What do you want with her? Or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. Did someone bring him food while we were gone, the disciples asked each other? Then Jesus explained, My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one plants and another harvests. And it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather their harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that He is indeed the Savior of the world. It's pretty powerful when people get that realization, when they get that truth and understand exactly who Jesus is. And This is just an incredible story. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. I might say that a lot, but uh, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, is just an incredible story. And you might be asking, wait a second here, aren't we going through this series walking with Jesus? Why is... Why are we even talking about this right now? Well, let me ask you something. Why is Jesus at this well? Because he's tired from what? Walking. So walking with Jesus. Jesus walked the well, and we can assume that that woman walked there also. So we will be picking up lessons from the disciples today. No, not from the disciples. They walked with him. But we're going to be grabbing some lessons that the Samaritan woman learned when walking to where Jesus was from him. Follow me on that? All right. Well, here we go. First lesson that she learns from Jesus is this. Don't get stuck on the past and what you can see. Don't get stuck on the past and what you can see. Let me read for you again verses 9 and 10 in the conversation that Jesus is having with this woman at the well. It says, The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you're speaking to, 
you would ask me and I would give you living water. See, let's talk a moment about the past here because this woman is stuck on the past and what she can see in front of her. And she knows the past. She knows something that maybe we do or don't know, but let me just share this with you. Because the beginning of this story is very unusual. Because it says that Jesus had to walk through Samaria. He had to walk through the northern area on his way down to Jerusalem. Why did he have to walk? For us, it makes sense. You know, if, if I want to go from Marysville to Yuba City, I have to take either the 10th Street Bridge or the 5th Street Bridge, the new Twin Cities Memorial Bridge, right? I have to go that way. But in actuality, if I want to get to Yuba City, and I want to go the long route, I could drive all the way up to Chico, and then come back down uh, to Yuba City. I could do that, right? I could go all the way to Sacramento and cut across some way. I could go way around. And the reason I'm saying that is because in Jesus' time, the Jewish people would do everything they could to avoid Samaria. They'd go all the way around it to not have to walk through and deal with the Samaritans. Why? The distance from Samaria to Jerusalem, it's like 35 miles. I, I had a, uh, There was a, uh, a writer that, that likened the distance that between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., 35 miles. And those two major cities share a similar, uh, same airport. And these two places are 35 miles apart. Why would they not just go right on through? Well, there's a lot of history. <clears throat> because Samaria is what you would call the northern area. And Judah, or sometimes called Judea, is the southern area. Now, here's the deal. At one time, this was all one. This was all the land of the Jewish people. The 12 tribes ruled there, and, and that was the promised land that they came into, that God had given them, that, that uh, he, Moses led them to the promised land, and then Joshua led them into it. And, and for a great deal of time, they had peace in that area, but they had some issues with the tribes. And the tribes broke apart. And then we had the 10 northern tribes in the area we call Israel, and then the two tribes that were in the south, in the area we call Judah. So they were split. Now, here's some of the complications as we read the story. Well, in Judah, it was with Jerusalem, and that's where the temple was. That's where everybody went to worship. So now, all of a sudden, the northern tribes are shut off from worshiping down in the southern area. They kind of have to come up with their own thing. And then, after a while, they start having enemies on all sides. They're not following God, and so God allows their enemies to conquer them. And this group called the Assyrians come in. They dominate and take over the northern area, and they move a bunch of people out, and they move a bunch of people in from other places. And at that point, the Jewish people that were still there were intermarrying with other races, other groups, other uh, religions from other places. And so their faith got kind of muddy. They were still worshiping God, but they were worshiping some other gods as well. They were worshiping on mountains and wherever they decided to, to worship in different ways. And after a certain amount of time, and I'm not quoting all the different years and stuff, but at, at some point they got their freedom back and some other folks moved in. But then the northern area became known as the area of Samaria. And the folks that were there weren't your pure-blooded Jewish people like in the south. They were a mix of these other cultures and races that had come in and mix with the Jewish people. And because they worshiped differently, because they worshiped multiple gods, and because they did different rules and followed different things because they had different customs, the people in the southern area of Judah hated the Samaritans, considered them dirty, considered them half-breeds, all kinds of terrible names. This woman knows all this. That's why she says, Hey, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are we having this conversation? Because I can see you. You're just a Jewish man and I'm just a Jewish woman. She is stuck in the past and what she can see right in front of her right there. And it's a shame. Because we get stuck on these stories and these names and these titles. It just happens. We get stuck on the past. You ever heard the story of the Good Samaritan? Sure you have. We use that term all the time. Oh, that was a Good Samaritan. Why do we call that story the Good Samaritan? Because the person who was good in the story was a Samaritan helping out a Jewish person after a couple other Jews did not help out that person in distress. So it becomes the Good Samaritan, not the story of the good person who helped out, 
We have to label, because it's so uh, unusual for a Samaritan to help out a Jew, that's why this story is so unusual that Jesus is talking to this woman at the well. It's why it's so unusual that Jesus is going through Samaria instead of going around it. But those are all things that we can get stuck on the past and what we can see right in front of us. And the woman at the well, she's stuck in the past, and the only thing she can see in front of her is a Jewish man who's really her enemy. But Jesus is about to help her to break free of that. Hallelujah. So, a question for us. What issues, or maybe even people, might we be stuck on with issues from the past? Or stuck on some things that we can just see in front of us that we're not sure what to do with? Maybe it's a situation we're just stuck on what we can see and not letting us be helped by Jesus. Because the woman from Samaria is about to be set free in a major way. And Jesus is about to help her break free of being stuck in the past and what she can see in front of her. And he's willing to do the same for us if we're in that same situation. Next lesson that she learns, another negative thing in a way, because it's a, a don't do these things, is that Jesus teaches her, don't get stuck on the temporal. Now, the temporal means something just happening right then and now, right? Temporary, when you think about it. It's, don't get stuck on the temporal. Let me take you back to verses 11 and 12 as their conversation continues. She says to him, But sir, you don't have a rope or bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy? And in this conversation she's having, it's pretty interesting. She's very analytical, isn't she? And you know what? It's good to be analytical at times. It's good to, when you're helping out in a planning meeting or things like that. It's good to see the roadblocks that might be in your path so you can address them. She's doing all that, but she is so focused on the temporal in front of her. She's so focused on the lack of tools needed to get water. What are you gonna, where's your bucket? Where's your pail? How are you going to do this? And she revisits the past again and says, well, you know, our ancestor, you think you're better than our ancestor? Which was a mutual ancestor for both of them, by the way. But she kind of focuses on that and how he made that amazing well. And she's looking at the temporal, the thing in front of the well that delivers the water. And Jesus doesn't have the tools. What is she missing here? She's completely missing his words entirely before that. Because his words that I read earlier, he said something along the lines of, if you knew the gift that God has for you. That's a big statement. If you knew who you were speaking to, he's inferring something special. And I can give you living water. No one was talking about God before. And now Jesus says that God has a gift for her. And he indicates that he's not just your average Jewish carpenter either. <laughs> he said, if you only knew who it was that you were speaking to. And then he says, I can give you living water. What is living water? Is that something that has like something growing inside of it? What would living water be like? And so it's amazing. He makes all those statements and she's so stuck on the temporal. She's thirsty. She's there for water. She wants to know how he's going to get water out of the well and how he thinks he's better. She's completely missed these concepts that God has a gift for her, that the person in front of her is something very special indeed, and that the water that he can provide for her is, is unlike anything she's ever seen or heard or tasted before. But she wants to know where his bucket is. And she's missing that. She's missing what God would have for her. She's missing who's speaking to her that's of major significance. She's missing it all in that moment. That's why this is the lesson that she learns. Because she is stuck on the temporal. And if we want to be like her and we want to learn to not be stuck on the temporal, we've got to ask that question. What, what might we be stuck on that's temporary in front of us? What is the temporal thing that maybe is in front of us and taking all of our time? We're so focused on that thing that we're missing 
the gift that God might have for us. That we're missing hearing the voice of Jesus who might be in front of us, or His Word is at least, but His Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. That we're missing the importance of the living water He provides that He says leads to eternal life. What are we stuck on, or what, we might, what might we be stuck on that's temporal in front of us right now? Because Jesus sets her free of that, and he can do that for us as well. Next lesson. Last, next lesson uh, for, for the woman at the well from Jesus is another one of those negative things that don't do things. Don't get stuck on the rules. Don't get stuck on the rules. Verses 19 through 20, let me read those for you again. It says this. Sir, the woman says, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? She's starting to recognize that Jesus is significant. But she's not quite putting it all together yet. Because she heard that God had a gift for her. She heard that Jesus can give her living water. If, you, if I told you, hey, God's got a gift for you, and I can give you living water, what questions would you have for me? You'd have a lot of questions, huh? What do you mean God's got a gift for me? What kind of gift? What's living water? What does it do? How do you give it to me? All these things, right? And we have a lot of... You know, we, it's a little easy for us because we know who Jesus is. We have the hindsight of reading the Gospels. We know what's going to happen next. We can see all those things. But I'll bet of all the questions that you would want to ask if I was to present that to you right now, you probably wouldn't be stuck on the rules. And you probably wouldn't ask me, well, what time is worship? And do we always worship at 10 a.m. on Sundays? And is that how it's got to be done? And are we done by 11? I mean, would you be stuck on the rules or would you want to know some more important questions from this potential prophet? And she has this opportunity. But she's so stuck on the rules that she wants to know what the rule is on where to worship. <laughs> wow. Can you imagine being so stuck on the rules? And I know we have hindsight on this. I know we do. But truly, she wants to be right about where she worships. And she wants to win the argument. So she wants to ask him. Do you think she's just curious? I don't, I don't, I don't read it as she's just curious. Maybe she is, but I, I certainly don't see that. She is so stuck on the rules... And that's more important to her than who is speaking to her or wanting to know what God is trying to say to her. Hey, look, rules are good. I really, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a rules follower most of the time. And I believe rules are good. And I think God's rules against sin are there to protect us. So don't hear me here today saying, I am not advocating break the rules and go out and sin. That's not what I'm saying at all. Do you remember the story of the, the disciples walking with Jesus on a Sabbath? And they were gleaning some, some, some wheat in the field. And, and the religious leaders came at Jesus and said, You know, look at how sinful your disciples are. They're, they're working on the Sabbath because they're working to take the, 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 the little... I, I don't even know how you glean wheat. I don't know. You squeeze something, you pop it out. I have no idea how to do that. I've never done that before. But whatever that was they were doing, and it was considered work. And Jesus settles them all down by saying, was man made for the Sabbath, or was the Sabbath made for man? In other words, the Sabbath is a rest day, and it's made for man to strengthen and help to rejuvenate their body. And these disciples needed some food on the rest day, so they went and got it. And Jesus was showing those religious leaders at the time, hey, don't get stuck on the rules when there's more important things going on. Jesus in that moment was stressing to the people, don't get stuck on the rules. This woman at the well in Samaria, she's stuck on the rules. She wants to know where to worship. She doesn't want to know what God's got for her. She doesn't want to know who she's talking to. She's kind of got that he's a prophet. She's figuring some things out. And she is stuck on the rules. The question for us today is, what, what rules might we be stuck on right now that are preventing us from from hearing or receiving what God has for us? Is there something that we're so stuck on that that's a rule 
that we have to do it, that it's keeping us from a relationship or time with God or just hearing his voice? It's a question we need to ask because Jesus is about to set her free from the rules and he can set us free too. Now remember, I'm not advocating go out and sin. I'm not talking about that at all. Don't go crazy on me here. But if Jesus can say that the Sabbath's made for man and, and those disciples could break that rule... And Jesus says, it doesn't matter where you worship because God is spirit and the true worshipers will worship in the spirit and truth. He's saying, don't get stuck on the rules. So whatever we're getting stuck on that might be rules oriented that's keeping us from a close relationship with God. We've got to learn the lesson that the woman in Samaria learns from Jesus and not get stuck on the rules. Those are three things that Jesus teaches the Samaritan woman not to do. Not to do, Right? Don't get stuck on the past and what you can see. Don't get stuck on the temporal. Don't get stuck on the rules. But the biggest thing he teaches her of all this is something that she needs to do. Remember these words. You've probably heard them before. Come and see. Go and tell. Come and see. Go and tell. Let me read two spots from the same chapter. And I don't know if you noticed, we've been in all the time in John chapter 4 this morning. Haven't haven't gone anywhere else. Normally I have a lot of backup uh, verses. I, I felt like we just need to be in John chapter 4 this morning looking at this. So John chapter 4, verses 28 through 30 say this. The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village, telling everyone, Come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. And then when we skip to the end of the story, verses 39 through 42 say this. <clears throat> Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I ever did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed for two days, long enough for many more to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe, not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the Savior of the world. The biggest decision you can ever make in your life is to place your faith in Jesus, ask for the forgiveness of your sins, and follow Him. That's the number one thing. When you read through the Bible, you will understand, both Old and New Testaments, but especially in the New Testament, that the emphasis is on relationship with Jesus. That's the most important thing. But after relationship with Jesus, we all have a job, whether we are called to be an evangelist or not. And evangelists are called to do it more than anybody else, but we are all called to come and see and then go and tell. And this woman at the well recognized that there was something that was not just for her. You know, Jesus told her, go get your husband. She said, I don't have a husband. He goes, you're right. You already had five. Now you're living with this other guy. And she's like, whoa, catches her attention. He never said, go get everybody in the village. But she knew that the thing that she had come there and seen that day was something that she needed to go and tell her entire village. And that's exactly what she does. She goes and tells everyone, and it says they came streaming in because she said, could it be the Messiah? He told me everything I ever knew. Is this the one we've been waiting for? And they come to hear, and when they come to hear, they invite him back to the village, and they make him stay two days. I don't know, was that on Jesus' uh, uh, planner for that week? Who knows? But they, they, they implore him, you got to stay two days. And people keep coming and hearing from Jesus because others are hearing and then they're going and telling other people in the village and other people keep coming and hearing to where they get to the point where they say, now we believe. Not just because of what you told us, but because we have seen and heard for ourselves and we understand that Jesus is indeed the Savior of the world. Hallelujah. What a moment to hear those folks exclaim that. That he is indeed the Savior of the world. That there is no doubt. We heard this thing. You went and saw, then you came and told us. So then we went and saw, and now we know what it is. And we're going to go tell other people too. That's the very reason that we are still worshiping today, some 2,000 years later, is because people continue to come and see and go and tell. Some of you are thinking to yourself right now, well, it's so easy though. They got to sit with Jesus for two days. Hey, 
It's going to take you a lot longer than two days to read through this book. Even if you just want to read the New Testament. If you just start the New Testament, the book of Matthew, and read it through, it's going to take you a lot more than two days. And if you read the whole New Testament and all the words of Jesus and all the people he taught and all the apostles and disciples and their words about how to follow Jesus and what they learned, then you will have come and seen and you will be prepared to go out and tell. You know, I personally like the come and see, go and tell, come to church, and then go and tell other people and invite them to church. I love that because we get to worship together, you know, and we do it here online in this very unusual time, right? But we also do it in person, and, and it's just a great time for us to gather together because what Jesus is offering us is not just for us. It's for the world. And when he came to that woman at the well in Samaria, he said, if you knew the gift that God has for you and who you're talking to, then you'd want this water because it leads to eternal life. I hope that you have received that gift from God, a relationship with Jesus Christ. I hope that you have received the forgiveness of your sins from him, and I hope that you have asked him to lead your life because then you have received the gift that God has for you. And you know who was talking to you, and you will have eternal life, that living water. And if you've done that, then it's time to go and tell somebody else and invite them to come and see. Maybe you invite them to church. Maybe you invite them to watch online church with you. Maybe you invite them to start reading the Bible together. But invite them to come and see so that they can be blessed and they can go and tell just like you did as well. A lot of amazing lessons today. Walking with Jesus. And some of you are like, eh, it's kind of like resting with Jesus because he was done with his walk. I'll give you that. But he walked there and got tired. She walked there. Walking with Jesus is still our, our theme that we are on. And the lessons we learned from this woman in Samaria that she learned from Jesus. Let me recap them. She learned to not get, don't get stuck in the past and what you can see in front of you. And we've got to learn that also. We can't get stuck on the past and what we know and what we think we see in front of us. We've got to be prepared for whatever God's going to reveal and set us free from. She learned don't get stuck on the temporal. She was so focused on what was right in front of her. And don't we do that at the same time too? We've got to let Jesus free us from getting stuck on the temporal and looking more at the eternal and what's coming in God's plan. She learned don't get stuck on the rules. Now, once again... Rules against sin are good. But other type of rules that sometimes can be bent or worked with, I think God would advocate if it leads to a greater relationship with Jesus and following Him. And the biggest thing she learned is that she does that we need to do as well. Come and see, go and tell. You've come and seen what Jesus did for her today. Now go and tell somebody this week about how Jesus set this woman free and the man she was living with and how many untold number of people in that village? Come and see, go and tell. God bless you on your week. Go out and share about Jesus with somebody. I hope to see you at our prayer time at Friday at the church. If not, I hope you can join us for the Gold Sox game on Saturday night. Love you all. God bless you. Have a great week.